In this first video, we're going to look at chemical equilibrium. This is the very first topic in Unit 3. And if I was a betting man, I would say the chances of chemical equilibrium coming up in your exam is 100%. There is no way they're not going to ask you questions on chemical equilibrium. So it's very important that you understand this concept so that you can apply yourself to any question that they might give you. Best way of explaining equilibrium, if I have some water in a beaker and I leave this to stand on the bench, what's going to happen to that water? It's going to evaporate and if I leave it for a few days or maybe a bit longer, all of that water will evaporate from the beaker. That's something we know that will happen, that's something we understand, that's a very simple process. What would happen if I put my hand over the top? Well, I'll probably put something else over the top, I don't want to be standing there for a week with my hand over the top but I'm closing that beaker to the environment. So now obviously the water that evaporates can't escape. So what's gonna happen? Well, how about this for an idea? The space above the liquid will fill with water vapor, but because it can't escape, then once that space is saturated with water vapor, then evaporation will come to a stop. That seems logical, yeah? Obviously, you know that is not what happens. Even though it looks like it's come to a stop, the reality is it's still evaporating. But how can that be if the space above can't take any more water vapor? Well, the only way, obviously, that can happen is if the water vapor is now recondensing back to liquid water. Now, at the start, obviously evaporation will be faster than condensation. But as time goes on, the rate of condensation will start to speed up. More molecules in the vapor means more collisions per second and therefore a faster reaction. And eventually, if you wait long enough, we will get a point where the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation are exactly the same. This is what we call chemical equilibrium. The analogy that I give to my students is if you went to a department store with a friend and they decided to walk up the escalator that was coming down, hopefully the security wouldn't you know, see. Um, now obviously if you've got to get up that escalator, you've got to walk faster than it's moving. So let's suppose you do that. But when you get about halfway up, you adjust your walking speed to the speed of the escalator. What's your friend going to see if he's looking at you side on? Now, you are going to look like you're standing still. He can't see from your waist down. So he can't see your legs are still moving, but you are still walking. But because you've matched the speed of the escalator, you don't actually move from that spot. You could be standing on a stationary staircase. So this is chemical equilibrium. It's a dynamic process. It has not come to a stop. The rates of both forward and reverse reactions are exactly the same. Now, because it's a dynamic process, it's possible to make changes to it. And many, many, many years ago, a French chemist called Le Chatelier came up with a principle, which you will have to know and you will have to apply. Le Chatelier said that if a change is made to a system in equilibrium, then the system will try to oppose that change. So whatever change you make, the system will try and do the opposite, to try and get back to what it was before. If you like, it chose the position of equilibrium that it wanted, and it's not going to be very happy if you try and do something about that. You will need to understand how concentration, pressure, temperature, and a catalyst can affect the position of equilibrium. So let's deal with them now. And the best way of dealing with them is to take an actual example. Um, one of the best examples that you will come across, you'll see it in most textbooks, is this equilibrium here. It's the equilibrium between dinitrogen tetroxide, N2O4, and nitrogen dioxide, N2O4. 
Now then, that reaction there is the one they like because this is a colourless gas and this is a dark brown gas, which means you can judge where the equilibrium is by the depth of colour. If it's virtually colourless, it's going to be lying heavily to the left. If it's a dark brown, it lies heavily to the right. And when the system shifts, it gets darker or lighter, depending on which way it's shifting. Now, hopefully you're happy with me saying things like equilibrium shifts uh, or lies to the left or right. These are terms you need to be able to use yourself. If this equilibrium lies to the left, then we will see that it's colorless. If it lies to the right, it'll be dark brown. If it shifts from left to right, it will get a darker brown. If it shifts from right to left, it'll get a lighter brown. All good? So let's think about some of the things that can affect it. Let's take concentration first of all. If we are in a position of equilibrium here where both gases are present, we will see a brown color of a certain depth of color. So let's say it's a sort of light brown at this point. Okay, now what would happen if I came along and introduced more of this gas? Don't worry about how that's done, maybe a syringe or whatever, but in some way we are putting more N2O4 in. What will happen to the position of equilibrium? Pause the video anytime you need to. If you need to think about it, then do so and then uh, unpause whenever you're ready. Okay, so I'm putting more of that in. Hopefully you would have said the system by Le Chatelier's principle will oppose you and shift to the right to remove the N204 that you've just added. In terms of rates, that is, is so obvious because if I have a certain rate of forward and a certain rate of reverse reaction, then when I put more of this in, there will be more N204 molecules bumping into each other, collision theory. And if you've got more of those bumping into each other every second, then it's going to speed up the forward reaction. Well, the reverse reaction hasn't changed. So therefore, the system will shift to the right. Okay? So you are expected to understand collision theory to explain the effect of changing concentration here. So what would happen if I was to take some NO2 away? Again, Le Chatelier says, well, the system will oppose you. It'll try and put it back and it'll therefore shift to the right again. But in terms of collision theory, if I take some of that away, there are less collisions per second taking place between these molecules. That slows down the back reaction, which therefore means the forward reaction is faster. And again, it shifts to the right. Concentration, okay, done. What about pressure? Well, pressure, hopefully you know, is is, is only exerted by gases. So if you see liquids or solids or aqueous solutions in an equilibrium, ignore them if you're asked about pressure. Only gases exert pressure. So a gas, when it bumps into the sides of the container, exerts pressure. So what we have here now is one mole of gas on the left and two moles of gas on the right. Well, two moles of gas are going to exert twice the pressure of one mole of gas. It doesn't matter what the chemical nature of the gas is. All gases behave in the same way when it comes to things like that. So the chemistry of the gas is not what we're interested in. We're purely interested in how much gas is present. So what about this? I come along and I increase the pressure on this system. Let's say it's in some sort of syringe or whatever and I push the plunger in, so I'm pushing the gas particles closer together, I'm increasing the pressure. What will happen? Okay, so Le Chatelier says an increase in pressure will be opposed by the gases trying to create a decrease in pressure. Well, how can they do that? Clearly, they will shift to the left where there's less gas, because less gas means less pressure. As easy as that. But remember, it only needs gases to be considered. If that was a solid, it would be no pressure there. Okay? Temperature. Now, a lot of people find temperature is the tricky one. 
because they don't fully understand things like exothermic and endothermic. This particular reaction is endothermic in the forward direction, which means its delta H, its enthalpy change, is positive in the forward direction. So this change here is endothermic, which means it absorbs heat from the surroundings, gets cooler, and if the forward reaction is endothermic, then logically the reverse reaction has to be exothermic. So when NO2 becomes N2O4, heat is produced, heat is given out, heat is lost by the system, and the surroundings then feel hotter as a result. So, here's my question. If I wanted to make as much NO2 as possible, would I want a high or a low temperature? Pause the video if you need to. Okay, well since the forward reaction is endothermic, Le Chatelier tells us that any change we make to a system is opposed. So if moving in the forward direction cools things down, then clearly I would want a high temperature if I wanted to make as much NO2 as possible. If I heat the thing up, the system will try and cool itself down. And that it can only do by absorbing heat in the forward direction. Okay. When we come on to the last part of Unit 4, and that's a long way away at the moment, we will look at some of the chemical syntheses, the harbour process, the contact process, and a few others. And temperature and pressure are absolutely vital when you consider industrial processes. So hopefully this understanding here will make it easy to understand why they use the conditions they do for those particular industrial processes. <laughs>